Hi everybody, it's Suzanne Wilson. I'm the Executive Director of Water to Thrive and today we have a very special guest with us. This is Dick Miller and he is the founder and the president of the board of Water to Thrive. So I know we have a lot more new followers so those of you out there who just started following us, thank you. We appreciate it so much. But we thought you might like to know a little bit more about Water to Thrive, how it got started, and, and how we do our work. So Dick is going to tell us a little bit about how Water to Thrive got started, the history, uh, how it all came to be. So Dick, you have it. <laughs> Thanks. Um, hello, everybody. Happy to be on this morning. Um, yeah, it all began in uh, 2007, actually, at a Sunday school class at uh, my home congregation in Austin, Texas, at uh, Triumphant Love Lutheran Church. Uh, one of our board members, Ed Charlow, was organizing a, a Sunday school class around world hunger and poverty, and one of the speakers came in and talked about the water crisis, uh, specifically in Ethiopia. And so... Uh, that motivated several of us to put together some matching funds for our Sunday school class. And, um, you know, before we knew it, our, our class had raised enough money to fund uh, four or five wells. And then the whole congregation kind of found out about it. And within 90 days, we had funded a total of 12 water projects in Ethiopia. Uh, that was the spark that really led to us deciding that, hey, if we can do this in our congregation, all we have to do is educate more people about it, and we can change a lot of lives. So by April of 2008, we had a nonprofit uh, organized and approved called Water to Thrive and really began um, then in earnest and reaching out and connecting to other people. Um, in the early days, the thing that really was very beneficial for Water to Thrive was we were able to establish a relationship with the thriving uh, financial representatives locally here in Texas, and they introduced us to a lot of uh, congregations here in Texas that really began the process. And so, as they say, the rest is history. It's been an incredible journey over the last uh, 11 or 12 years, and um, totally um uh, blown away by the level of participation from people that learn about what we're trying to do. And, and the water crisis is still a big issue in the world. We don't think about it. I mean, yeah. I was driving to work this morning and, you know, I, I took a shower. I, I made my cup of coffee using water. Never yeah. thought about where the water is going to come from, whether it's safe to drink. But every day there are 663 million people worldwide who do not have access to clean water you've been to the countries where we work i've been there you see children as young as three and four years old women who start their days looking for water so sure. it, you know in the dark they go looking for water to drink and it's water many times it's that's not not safe to drink the animals are drinking out of the same water there's excrement in the water people are bathing in that water so yeah for sure and you know, it's um, uh, when we first began. You know, it was it felt like an impossible task. Uh, when you when you go visit the countries and you see so much need, but you know, at the end of the day, it's about helping one family, helping one village, one community get water, and it forever changes their life in terms of productivity and the economics and all of that sort of thing. Um, and, you know, the, the um, progress has been made. Uh, when we started uh, 11 or 12 years ago, there were over a billion people without clean water. And as Suzanne said, that number is down in the 600 uh, uh, million range now. So we're making progress, and it's because of folks like you that help us. And there are hundreds of other water NGOs around the world that are, that are putting clean water out. Something you said when you were interviewing me for this position, uh, and it stuck with me ever since, you said, you know, when you go to Africa, and not just Africa, but even in, in our country, there's so much need. You see so much need. But th the thing is that, you know, each one of us can do something, and right. that we can help somebody. We can help at least one person, no matter, you know, who we are. Uh, but along with that, water is a fundamental need. You know, we can do without a lot of things. I can do without this coffee. I can do without my car. But you can't live without water. So I think I think that's what drives it home and how important our mission is that you cannot, no one can live without water. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I personally strongly believe that water is the gateway to economic progress for the communities that we help 
you know, I'm a business person by background and an engineer. And so, um, you know, you can think about a lot of different things that communities need. They need health care. They need uh, education, all of those things. But when it comes to water, uh, it's really practically impossible for communities to make economic progress unless they have daily access to clean water. It frees up uh, the the young children to be able to go to school. It frees up the females in the household to be able to do other productive things and generate income for the family. So uh, it really makes a huge amount of difference. Yeah, our tagline is build wells, uh, change lives. So I think that's what it's about. You don't think about all the things that are indirectly or even directly tied to having water. You know, we see it all the time, these women who say, oh, now I I have time to start a small business. I can, you know, raise some chickens and have, you know, eggs for my family or I can sell them. The children, you know, have time to go to school. And not only that, but they're not sick when they go to school. So it's impactful beyond what you guys could imagine. And and it's a... It's a methodology of improving social justice in these communities. It, it does so much for the females in the community in terms of giving them a way to have a voice and to be active in the leadership of the community. Absolutely, and I think one of the things that when I talk about it that people love is each one of the water wells has a committee that provides oversight and that we require 50% of that committee to be female because they're responsible for gathering water. Right. You know, it impacts their lives more than anyone else. So that's that's crucial to uh, the work that we do. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, talk a little bit about how we do the work. When, you know, when people say, oh, they always ask me, they're like, how do you <clears> find the villages that need water and you know how do you do this work I always tell them I'm not a well digger I'm not an engineer you are but you're also not a well digger right. so talk a little bit about you know how we do our work well I think one of the things that philosophically uh, we agreed on when we first began uh, water to thrive was uh, to be careful that we didn't spend our donors money on things that other people could do better than we do and so with that model, we have always utilized local non-government organizations in the countries that we work in. Um, so we vet the relationships with them. We make sure that their values match ours. But we depend upon them uh, to do the field work in the communities with the communities that are going to wind up getting water. Um, so they typically do proposals for us. It'll be anywhere from 10 to 60 projects in the proposal. And then we utilize that as a program grant agreement where we monitor those projects, their progress, and we provide GPS coordinates and pictures back to our donors whenever they're completed. Uh, but all of that work is done locally with the community and with our implementing partner. And they often hire the local uh, uh, people in the community to help do the manual labor. So it's economic development even. Right, exactly. It provides some jobs. Yeah. Uh, Most of our partners have uh, geologists and uh, water and sanitation experts uh, and hydrologists on their staff. And so they go about the process of working with often the local water bureau to find out exactly where the water should be located. Yeah, so it's not just a, uh, a, a peck and hunt or no, throw, a, throw a... and you know, we've been really fortunate over the years. Um, I would say that on an average year, we wind up maybe only having somewhere in the neighborhood of 5 to 8% of our water projects have to be relocated uh, because when the project is started, they don't wind up finding water or the water table. Um, but, you know, that, that's a pretty good record, actually. Yeah, people have always asked me that too. It's like, you know, how many are the wells are still working and what if they hit a dry hole? But basically our partners, if, if the water isn't found where they drill, then they drill another hole. Right. So it's part of that part of that accountability and security that we're making sure we get water to these people. So yeah. I think that's I think that's really, really important. Um, you know, our partners are wonderful and they do a great job, but as you mentioned, I think the vetting is important. So it's part of the accountability. So when Dick goes there, when I go there, we're, we're checking on the projects. So for our donors, it's about making sure that the work done is, is work is done correctly, that we can, you know, see it, that we can talk to the beneficiaries and know that now they have clean water and also share their stories with, with you, the donors and the people who support what we do. 
Yeah, and a big part of our governance over the oversight of the projects and working with our partners is we have a full-time person uh, living and working in Ethiopia, uh, Gashau, and he uh, is a water and sanitation expert and um, is heavily involved on a regular basis with our partners and overseeing the quality of the work and making sure that we're kind of on track, on track with the uh, schedule and the budget. Yeah, we, we have a funny saying um, th that we share when things don't go exactly as we plan. Yeah. We say TIA, this is <laughs> Africa, because, you know, sometimes it, it it's a rainy season and you can't get to the well sites. Um, sometimes there are protests and it's not safe to try to do these things. So, you know, we do things maybe not at the, at the uh, timetable that most Americans or most projects here would happen, but they still get done. So, Dick, can you share something that maybe you found surprising when you start doing this work or something you learned as you were doing the work in, in East Africa? And by the way, for those of you who are new to us, we work primarily in East Africa, the countries of Ethiopia, Uganda, and Tanzania. He mentioned earlier that the presentation he heard, the folks were working in Ethiopia, so it was a natural place for us to go because we already had some contacts there and we've expanded out to the countries that are neighboring. So that's how we sort of started working in East Africa. But can you share me with me a little bit of a story or surprising? <laughs> well, sure. You know, um, I've been blessed to be able to go to East Africa probably 16 or 17 times over the last 11 or 12 years. And practically every time you go, you find out something new or you experience something different. But I think the fundamental thing for me is the blessing of always going over there is how much joy the people experience and realize from just the simple fact of getting the availability of clean water on a daily basis. Um, being at a village that inaugurates a well and the village gets water for the very first time in their history is an incredible experience and uh, something that you'll never forget. And so we definitely invite, uh, whenever we're gonna be able to get back to traveling again, we invite our donors to go with us to either visit their personal water projects or to visit water projects in general. But, um, you know, it, it's amazing how much joy there is in communities where, you know, relative to our economic circumstances, we think they're a poor developing country but in fact, in many ways, they find joy in things that we sometimes overlook and don't realize how important they are. Uh, so that, that, to me, is the thing that keeps driving me to go back. Yeah, that's, that's another question people ask me. It's like, isn't it hard to go there? Because the travel is not luxurious. No. <laughs> uh, you do with a, lot, a lot of things that we are accustomed to. But what I always say is, you know, when I enter these villages and when I talk to the people and they express how grateful they are and they've just killed a goat or a chicken to feed me and they bring me coffee that's just been brewed or, you know, they're, they're singing and they're dancing. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, how can we not keep doing this work? It just it brings it home uh, that it's that it's so very important. And I feel like, you know, I'm just a very, very tiny little piece of that. But they make you feel like you know, that you're so important and that the work is important, which it is. The water is important. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think the other thing that I would share in terms of lessons learned is how important uh, what we call the water, the sanitation and hygiene portion of our work. Um, you know, we talk about water and we talk about finding water and digging wells and that sort of thing. But in a, in a lot of respects, that's the easy part, right? Because water is there, it, it's in a water table. Uh, it's a matter of just using either a hand dug process or some other process to get to it. And it's often within a hundred feet of the surface. So usually there's not a lot of risk around finding and gaining access to the water. The big issue is long-term, how do you make sure that that project is functional 10, 15, 20 years from now? And the only way that happens is to integrate and make sure that the community is involved in maintaining and taking care of the, of the project. And Suzanne mentioned earlier about uh, the water committees, that's their responsibility. That's what they do. They collect money from the community. They build a maintenance account. Uh, they have processes for 
uh, opening and closing the well and making it available for the community. They collect the monthly fee from the community members. Um, so the important part of, of making sure that we have a project that lasts a long time is engaging the community, having them become responsible for its function, and then providing them the tools and the education around sanitation and hygiene training to make sure that project is protected and lasts a long time. Yeah, speaking of a personal story, I remember at one of the wells, uh, the village had decided to hire a young man who was disabled to be the guard, which I thought was a fabulous idea. I'm like, mm -hmm. they've given him employment now from this and they're paying him a little bit out of that out, out of that user fee to open and close the the gates and protect it and, and, and to be there. So I thought that was just I thought that was just a fabulous way to build in some economic development for somebody who probably didn't have any other means yeah. of employment. Um, can you talk just a little bit about the projects too? Because that's another great question. People are like, you know, what kind of projects do you do? And what about, uh, you know, do you have some kind of generator? And is there a pump? And I always tell them that we work in very, very rural villages. So, you know, this is not something that, that is available. So it has to be a pretty basic design for them to keep, to be able to maintain, but also that makes it cost effective for us to be able to help a lot of villages. Yeah, that's, that's uh, so true. And, and, Part of what's important here in terms of the longevity of the project is to make sure that it's simple enough that the local community can manage it and take care of it and fix it if something breaks. And so we typically do um, three different kinds of projects. I'd say about 60 or 65 percent of our projects are what's called hand dug wells. And when we say hand dug, they're really hand dug and that's really appropriate for, as Suzanne described, Many of these locations are very remote and without roads. And so uh, often the cement and the sand and the gravel and the pump and the pump head and all that has to be hand carried in by the community members uh, to the location of the well. Um, so it's typically done by local labor with uh, picks and shovels and buckets and tripods and pulleys and ropes. Uh, but they're very efficient at it, and they, they do a great job. And in areas where the soil is soft and might cave in, they put uh, rings around it so that it uh, is stable and, and won't collapse. So that's, that's our primary kind of project is a hand dug well. Secondarily, I would say uh, probably 20 or 25 percent of our projects are spring development systems. So in some parts of the countries that we work in, there are surface springs that run 24-7, 365 days out of the year. And often the local people know which of those springs will run and provide water even through the dry season. So when we find a spring like that, that has enough volume that it will serve the community, then we protect it. Uh, if it's not protected, then, you know, People use it to, to bathe in, animals come in and drink and might defecate in it and that sort of thing. So we put um, a spring box and a reservoir on it so that the water is protected and clean. And then there'll be three or four faucets on the reservoir so that the community, community can draw water from it. In a few areas, probably the remaining 10 or 15% of our projects are done with a borehole drilling machine, and they can go typically to a depth of 100 to 120 feet. Uh, but to get a drilling rig there, you gotta have a, at least a, a semblance of a road uh, to, to be able to get it to a place like that. Uh, but the pump head is still very simple. It's a manual uh, labor, and it's a siphon pump, and it's very easy to maintain and, and repair by the community, and the community is trained on how to do that and are given spare parts and tools to be able to take care of it. And the third pro type of project, did you mention that, the borehole? Yeah, okay. I would just talk okay. about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, along with that, it's it's the, the cost. People are always curious about the cost of the well. So, so far we've been able to maintain the cost of 5000 to fully fund a well which means everything that's involved means the, the labor, the materials from start to finish, including the training, sanitation, and hygiene. So part, part of what Water to Thrive offers is something we call 100% promise. 
That means any donation for water goes entirely to that project. So if you donate $5,000 for well or $10 for water, it goes to fund a well, even if you don't fund one entirely yourself. So a little bit about the well funding, you know, uh, again, everybody can do something. So whether it's $10 to give one person water, $70 to give a family water, or if you wanna, you know, go in with your church, with your youth group, with your school, with your family and, and you know, fundraise, run a campaign to raise money to fund a well, then that's another way that you can, that you can help out. So, um, any other things you want to add to that as far as helping out, how people can get involved? Well, of course, um, you know, talking about the 100% promise, um, you know, we, we manage the cost uh, so that the average comes out $5,000. Um, it's true that every project doesn't cost the same amount when it's being implemented. Boreholes are more expensive than uh, spring protection systems and uh, hand dug wells are kind of in the middle. Um, and occasionally we'll do a rehabilitation well, which is a place where a community has had water in the past, but for whatever reason, the project uh, is no longer functioning. And so our partner goes in and works with the community to rehabilitate the well. Um, so we take all of those different kinds of projects and average it out so that the average comes to $5,000. And we treat that way, we can treat every donor uh, the same way. Every donor pays the same amount of money to fund a well, water well. So as Dick mentioned early on, uh, Water to Thrive has been around since 2008. And we're a very small team. Dick still, even though he's uh, sort of kind of retired, not really. <laughs> no, uh, not really. <laughs> not really. <laughs> he does a lot of work with Water to Thrive, managing the projects. Uh, we have, uh, besides myself, one other full-time person. Dick is just the person who volunteers. And we have four other part-time people here. So we're really grassroots. But I think, to me, I think it's amazing that in that time, we've funded over 1,100 wells. So that means water for over half a million people. So I think for a small grassroots organization, it's it's been tremendous. Yeah, and we've uh, been incredibly blessed <laughs> to have uh people respond and uh, help us through this process, right? I mean, this is this is all about connecting with people, educating them on the need, and then providing them the tools to help them raise resources so that they can fund water projects. Um, and we've just been incredibly blessed by having organizations all around the United States and even some internationally that have been able to support uh, our work. Yeah, absolutely. So again, right now, if, if you're wondering how you can get involved, of course, we would love for you to support us with a donation. But if that's not um, uh, available for you right now, we would love for you to share this video, to to comment, to follow us, to let other people know about the work. Right now, we're taking signups for our email, and we have a new program where one dollar will be known, donated for each email signup. So if you go onto our website, sign up to be to receive our emails, our newsletter, then one dollar will be donated to Water. So that's going to be that's going to be really really cool. Other ways, of course, you can always start a well campaign with your family, friends, church. Uh, we also have the Water Guardian program, and right now we have, it's a monthly giving program, but for right now, if you give, your first month's donation will be matched. So that's a that's a real easy give. It's a $10, $35, or $50, that's the max, but you can give any amount. You can get a dollar a month. We have donors who say, I can only give you know $3 a month, and that's fine because every little bit helps. Don't think that you can't make an impact and you can't help us. Yeah, so, and so just... To kind of drive that point home, over our history, it has cost us about $10 per person that we have helped bring water to. So kind of typically of what we would spend collectively on a, a large latte at Starbucks, if you buy two of those, you can fund water for uh, a person in East Africa for 15 or 20 years. Yeah. So it's an incredible investment and we really appreciate everybody uh, being part of that. Absolutely. Again, thank you, everybody. Hope you have a great day. Yeah. Stay, stay safe out there. Bye. Bye.